Hello, good morning. Um, good evening, everybody. My name is Shua Khan. I am, we are starting um, our um, ELISA mini-conf at the Open Source Summit today. And we have a panel of speakers that will be talking about various aspects of ELISA and the, sharing the work that we have been doing these past uh, several months. Um, what, let's start with what is um, um, ELISA to begin with. Um, ELISA is uh, enabling Linux uh, in safety critical applications. And what we are really doing um, is in terms of uh, enabling, what does enabling mean really? So we are looking at assessing whether the system is safe and we, need, we are understanding well, you would, uh, our systems sufficiently. We, um, if your safety systems, uh, system safety depends on Linux, you need to understand um, Linux sufficiently for your system's context and use. So that's really the keywords here, using um, understanding your system context and how to use Linux safely on, in, on that system. Uh, so we are looking at a couple of different ways of safety critical process approach to Linux. We, the difference between, uh, we are looking at the uh, Linux development process um, and then applying it to how well we can use that uh, development process and safety, map it to the safety critical um, uh, standards that's, and, and see how we, well we can understand, uh, come up with the guidelines to understanding your system. Uh, and make sure that Linux can run safely on those systems. So what is our mission statement? Uh, we are uh, defining and maintaining a common set of elements and processes and tools that can be incorporated into specific Linux-based uh, safety critical systems. Uh, amenable to safety certification. That's a lot of uh, big words, but essentially what it is is we are looking at, so this is our development process. Um, and then these are the set of safety standards we have, and we kind of map them to see uh, over uh, to, to with the tools, use of tools and processes that we have and say, hey, you, you can uh, certify, not certify, but I mean, you can say, this is, um, this is how you can um, map the development process to the safety elements safety certifications um, elements in terms of uh, tools and such. So we have um, several working groups, kernel development working group, looking at kernel processes and reference processes and looking at gaps, identifying gaps and where we can fill in gaps to be able to, uh, uh, to meet the safety uh, standards. Uh, we have several safety standards here uh, that we kind of keep looking at and then map, trying to map. And then safety architecture group is doing the same thing in a different way, uh, safety relevant elements um, and platform safety analysis and then mapping them. So we kind of go through these um, um, paths to closing the gaps in way two um, to say that the Linux can be safely used and define um, a path forward for uh, identifying gaps and then outlining what is necessary in terms of uh, processes and tools. Uh, these are the working groups that we have currently. Um, I, kernel development working group, safety architecture working group, and tooling and development. That's there we are doing a lot of um, work as well, identifying tools to see, um, looking at the tool aspects and then uh, checking those those tools give, will give us a way for to map the development process what's happening identifying um, how to map these development processes in terms of uh, maybe we have uh, we identified a kernel memory a, a kernel subsystem as a safety uh, critical for us and then looking at the development process what's happening there and how do we uh, figure out um, the changes that are happening and then de define a process for being able to translate that development process and then identifying the changes that are happening in terms of put the safety context to them. Um, 
with that, I am going to hand it off to Christopher um, to talk about kick off the uh, the mini talk, mini conference. I mean, his topic. Yep. Me Thank you. Here, here. Thank you. Um, and now let me just share. Mm -hmm. And. Here we should go. So, um, yeah, um, we, we, we thought we'd organize the, the, the conference of also with some lightning talk. So what's a lightning talk? And lightning talk is kind of to throw a bolt of lightning into the discussion and then see if any thunder comes back. So this is really reaching out to everyone on the call to engage. Um, you can use the chat. I'll show you in a second what 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 we have thought about. So one of the, the big challenges in enabling Linux for safety critical applications and for, for, for pretty much for any, any system is always managing complexity. So um, the complexity is, is a significant issue and it's one that we really uh, struggle with on a daily basis because if you look at the position that an operating system takes in a, in, in, in a complete um, system context, then you will see that the operating system on the one hand provides an interface towards the hardware architecture. So it, the people writing the operating system, kernel developers usually have a sometimes better understanding of the underlying hardware architecture than the one or the other hardware architect who has actually developed the hardware because the, the kernel programmers see the architecture as this active, right? All the cogs are spinning and interacting with one another. And that is a far more complex picture of, of a hardware architecture. And if you just read a reference manual where everything looks, you know, either this happens or this or this or this, usually if you have multi-core systems on a modern CPU architecture, 1000 things happen in parallel. So there's a level of complexity towards the hardware there might be a hypervisor layer in between, um, and there is complexity and in an interface towards the application. So what we have been asking ourselves, you know, will it be helpful to the objective of ELISA to somehow get control of the complexity? What, what can we do? And um, what one uh, area that, that we have been discussing quite intensely is, you know, what complexity, um, levels are brought into the problem by the application itself. Um, and this discussion emerges out of different areas, right? On the one hand, um, we continuously have parties joining the working groups and saying, why, wh what are you doing, right? Linux, I, I know of a system where Linux is already used in a safety critical application. So, so the problem is solved. Um, and uh, then you say, okay, but how is it used? And in what way is it used and what specificities does the application have that can be exploited? Uh, so this is a very crude uh, separation into two classes. I intentionally, the beginning, I we, we had called them class one and two, but that then makes it hard to explain what the classes are in between. So we gave them a neutral labeling, right? A low end and a high end, and you can imagine any uh, shade of gray and any rainbow color in between. But really, the, the two extreme is to say if we have low safety complexity, then that clearly is a, is helpful to bringing to enabling Linux and safety critical applications. So those systems typically are ones where transient faults are, are less critical uh, or not critical. The, the, the system has a low pass characteristic. Um, permanent faults are, are critical. You have to leave some some safety aspect in there, otherwise it gets it gets trivial. Um, the fault tolerance time is, is long compared to the execution speed of, of the software on, on, the, uh, on the system. Very, very frequently you have a human in the loop, which is great because the, 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 the fault tolerance time interval, which is the time between when a fault occurs and when something dangerous happens um, is, is long. So the human can intervene. That takes a lot of pressure because human is always uh, ideal to place some plausibility checks on. 
if he's awake in the context of autonomous driving, you can put end-to-end -end plausibility checks in place because in many cases, you're not moving a lot of data around the system. So you can put integrity wrappers around the data by using some kind of hash or CRC function. Uh, you not so frequently see mixed criticality integrated on one system where you say, I'm, I'm really trying to get multiple systems operating in the context of, of, for example, one Linux instance, and they shouldn't interfere with one another. And lastly, you're looking at, at lower levels of safety integrity. And then on the high end side, um, it's, it's transient faults become critical. So you need to also have some way of, of engaging quite tightly with the hardware, because the hardware in many cases will detect the transient faults or the software has to do it. In both cases, you need tight coupling. The permanent faults are, are equally cr uh, critical, but this time the fault tolerance time is short, so you don't have much time. Usually it, it could be 10 milliseconds or 100 milliseconds. That's by far not enough time to get the human into the loop. End-to-end uh, -end plausibility checking in, in the extreme high-end case is, uh, is not plausible anymore because you're using huge data volumes. And if you start putting end-to-end -end checks over all the data you're moving around the system, your performance just, just gets crippled. Um, in many cases, you're looking at mixed criticality and, and you're starting to look at the highest level of safety integrity, which is which is A's and B. So, so on the right hand, I, I've, I've tried to, to illustrate um, the, the, the class L, which we have a use case we're, we're looking at at the moment in the context of ELISA, which is IVI telltales. So you can imagine a TFT dashboard uh, in your car and you need to be sure that an important piece of information a warning indication or whatever is shown on the TFT to alert the driver of something. So you have driver in the loop, right? So, so we're already seeing that we're qualifying for the class L. Um, and typically those that, that problem is solved by obtaining the bitmap from the TFT and then running, for example, a graphics algorithm over the bitmap and looking whether the telltale, the exclamation mark or whatever your telltale symbol is, is actually shown on the TFT and then taking some corrective action, maybe alerting the driver by, by, by some chimes or switching off the dashboard or, or doing other things. There are, there are many solutions that are being considered in the industry. Um, and in those cases, clearly the, the requirements on the operating system itself are, are, are rather low. That, that makes it quite nice to enable Linux for those kind of applications because the bar is, is, is lower, right? Then you have EGAS type applications, that's more EGAS is, is a, a safety architecture used for electronic thr uh, throttle systems in the car. It's starting to get, get more, more, more sophisticated from, from the requirements from the fault tolerance time. But even in EGAS, there is still the assumption that there is a human in the loop because at least in the case of a combustion engine and a normal car, the acceleration that a car can produce is limited. And there is still the idea that the driver will realize that the car is suddenly taking off and um, can step on the brake. And brakes are always designed in a way that, that they can, they can even the strongest cars can be stopped by, by the braking system. Uh, then you're looking at gateway systems. Gateway systems, you're starting to see it's getting harder because you're not having, you don't have a human in the loop anymore. You're translating data from one sub-network into the system to the other. And if you're transferring safety critical data over the gateway, then you want to ensure that the data doesn't get corrupted inadvertently or doesn't get lost and other uh, or, or modified or, or get stuck and you continuously repeat sending stale data, but you have an end-to-end -end with a valid end-to-end. -end. So you need to start including time stamps and other aspects. So the, the, the problem is getting more sophisticated. And then on the right hand, uh, what I see as probably the most sophisticated safety problem at the moment in the industry is really everything around autonomous driving. So um, what what and what now we also see is that there is the option of uh, enabling Linux in a safety application, potentially even through qualification. So what does qualification mean? Qualification means you have a, a, a highly a high quality development process that produces software and the failure modes of that software are reasonably stable. So you characterize the failure modes, but then you put the mitigation of those failure modes around the software. You don't put it into the software itself. 
And for some application classes, and the IVI might be one where that is feasible, you could actually get away with this qualification path. But that enables Linux for a safety application of class L, right? On Tuesday, I already explained it, it's tricky. You don't want to have um, the case where someone enables Linux for one class and someone else just transfers that into a different class where the assumptions aren't valid anymore. And um, the key question, and I think this is where I'd be interested also in getting feedback from the audience. If there's someone there from, 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 from an, an OEM and tier one side who actually wants to use Linux, what, what are the characteristics of the application classes that you have in mind where you really say, this is the immediate direct use case that I would have where I want to use where I want to use Linux and I want to use the result of the ELISA project. I think we're, we're always open and welcome to, to, to look at that. At the moment, we're, we're looking at IVI and we're, we're, we're contemplating on how to take arguments to a higher level of, of safety complexity. But that definitely is, is an interesting uh, question. And on the lower end of, of the sandwich I showed on the previous slide, it's also what kind of, of hardware are you envisioning, right? Are you looking more at, at, at lower end uh, single core uh, products? Or are you looking at, at really highly sophisticated multi-core? And when, when, when someone from ARM talks about highly sophisticated multi-core products, then, then we're st starting with 32 cores, 64 cores or beyond. Those, those are massive platforms uh, and they introduce problems of, of their own nature. Uh, that have to be that have to be addressed. So if there, I, I need to now see how this works myself. Um, how do I see the the chat window with questions? Can someone help me? Do we have? Do we have? We do not have any questions right now. Do we not have any questions? Okay. So so the. The, the ask is out there, right? To the audience, if, you're, if you have specific features or whatever you want to see addressed, then, um, then get in contact with us because we're always interested in, in, in hearing use cases um, and then putting some, some consideration into the, the, the effort it takes to, to address them. If there aren't any questions at the moment, there's still the possibility to, to we're probably gonna have a, a short Q&A session towards the end for if, if questions emerge. Uh, otherwise, I'll hand over the baton to the next speaker. So G Gabriel, I think you're next. Do you wanna share your screen and? Yep. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Christopher. Okay, one second. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. All right, good. Um, okay, so uh, first, a uh, quick introduction. So I'm uh, Gabriele Valoni, and uh, you know, I'm uh, I actively work in ELISA and uh, I lead uh, the Safety Architecture Working Group. And today, I I would like you to, to present uh, a use case, a problem that we've been discussing now for quite some time within the, the architectural working group. So the, the focus of the working group is uh, to, uh, you know, to, to analyze uh, the technical safety requirement that uh, can derive uh, from domain specific working groups. However, uh, as of today, so, uh, we are waiting uh, for uh, uh, technical safety concepts to come in. And therefore, basically, we've put together these, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, sample uh, use case. OK. And uh, so and that we have been uh, that, that we've been analyzing so far. OK, so here what you're looking at is um, in this picture, we have uh, uh, an x86 system. Um, I mean, the, the analysis, I mean, the, in the working group, we are also looking at the ARM architecture, but uh, here, I mean, the, the, the analysis, uh, I've done it like extensively for x86. So we have uh, a machine check uh, exception that is caused by um, memory read error that is causing a synchronous uh, machine check exception. And this exception is handled by 
uh, do machine check. And this can turn into two possible uh, outcomes. One is, so this exception happened in the user space and therefore uh, we have the uh, signal handler that will terminate uh, the user space application or otherwise if in kernel space, in, if in kernel space today, we go and, uh, and, and panic, okay? And uh, on the top, uh, what we have is we have a, a very, very dummy uh, safety function that is uh, petting an external watchdog every uh, safety cycle, okay? So, that is, so, so effectively, regularly, we have this uh, watchdog pet. And uh, as we have an exception coming in, we need to stop this petting, either by termination of the application or by killing the system, okay? And, uh, uh, basically, in this case, the watchdog will uh, will come out and uh, and drive uh, the system into into safe state. And um, along with this analysis, we, we made um, a strong assumption that is, so we assume that the memory error itself uh, does not affect uh, the the proper execution of the error handling code in Linux. Uh, because uh, you know our analysis is focused uh, on Linux itself, and uh, we don't have control of uh, of uh, a broken uh, hardware. Okay, so now um, obviously, uh, so regardless of the uh, usability, let's say, of this uh, specific uh, example, um, I think that. Uh, during the analysis, there were some challenges that we found and that today uh, I would like to, to share with you and also to, to see what is your uh, opinion in, uh, in this regard, okay? Uh, okay, so if there are no questions on the overall uh, uh, introduction uh, and on, this, uh, on, on the use case, I can go to the, to the second slide. So the first challenge is, you know, as I said, the focus of the working group is to uh, deliver uh, safety analysis uh, according to, to, to specific use cases. And uh, so that as outcome of the uh, safety analysis, we can refine architectural assumption. We can identify what are the safety relevant uh, Linux uh, components, and, uh, and and eventually also, you know, we can uh, we can uh, uh, improve the the code or uh, you know uh, upstream changes to have uh, uh, maybe some safety mechanisms, some some code changes, and, and so on. Okay, so now the first, the very first challenge was, okay, now in Linux uh, we know that there is no uh, architectural description. And uh, in fact, uh, every Linux developer, what he does mainly is uh, he just go and read the code to, to understand what the code does, okay? And uh, whereas in the safety world, usually the safety analysis are performed on uh, UML diagrams or uh, in general uh, on, on, on architecture documents that would describe the, the system design and uh, its behavior, okay? So the first challenge is, okay, so there was, right now there is no architectural description in Linux, okay? So, so what I had to do is I started from the do machine check handler, okay? I opened the code and then I have uh, tried to, to, to figure out to, to, I, I basically used a top-down approach where starting from the main entry point, that is do machine check, then I try to identify what were the pieces of code that could affect my safety goal. Okay, so effectively, the, the, practically speaking, I want to identify what were the functions involved in either the system going to panic or into the termination of the of the safety application. Okay, 
And so, and, and there basically using this top down approach, I, I, I basically, I drafted an extensive analysis that um, you, can, you can find at the link at the bottom. And uh, in doing so, I clearly discarded the, the, the parts that I, in my view, uh, were not uh, meaningful, uh, were not, uh, uh, were not uh, significant with respect to the, uh, to the safety goal itself. So for example, I discarded the, uh, the part about the, the serial logging, okay? Because I assumed that from a safety perspective, we are not relying on a human being reading the serial log to, you know, to, to, to shut down the, the power, for example. Okay. So, and uh, so this is, was, this was like, uh, was a kind of lengthy uh, process. So how, now the question is, how can we improve that? And uh, in general, like probably, a short, a short answer that I found is, as I did the safety analysis, I realized that there is a lot of information that is currently missing, uh, even in the kernel doc headers of the, of the function. Most of the functions are missing the kernel doc header. So, but even for those that have a kernel doc header, you know, it's not, the description doesn't seem to be enough, okay, to, to, to do like a sort of, uh, to do a, a, to support a, a safety analysis. Okay, so, uh, so in my view, like one outcome is that definitely we, we can use the, this uh, safety analysis to, to improve the kernel uh, doc header of the function so that maybe as next step, um, you know, uh, another safety analysis would be uh, quite e easier uh, with, uh, compared to, to what uh, to, to what uh, I had to do. Okay. Um, another challenge is: Can we guarantee the safety up termination within a deterministic maximum amount of time? So we can see here that we have two different paths. Okay. So kernel mode exception, we can see that we call do machine check, MC panic, and then panic. In doing so. Uh, we do not rely on the scheduler. is is a pretty self-contained piece of code that is running uh, in uh, in interrupt uh, mode. So the, let let's say that so the, the, in, we, we, from a, a, let's say a real time point of view, this seems to be at first glance uh, quite deterministic. Okay, obviously we need to run tests and so on, but let's say that uh, from uh, an architectural analysis point of view, I, I, I didn't find uh, too many risks associated. User mode exception is different, okay? So user mode exception, we see that here we rely on the, on, on the scheduler effectively, you know, to, to call the, the, the signal handler and then to, to kill uh, the, the application. So, in, in this regard here, you know, uh, obviously we have two options here. So from a safety perspective, we can either change the user mode behavior to behave the same as a kernel mode, or we need to extend the analysis also to the, to the scheduler itself and the other uh, components involved. So that, that would be uh, quite a uh, different level of, uh, of complexity, okay. And uh, the, the third point is, as I did the, the safety analysis, obviously we, what we did, we scoped out what are the most relevant uh, pieces of code supporting these use cases, okay. And uh, now going back to the, to the kernel doc uh, documentation that today is missing, Obviously, another advantage of uh, enhancing this kernel doc will be to be able, you know, to define testing specification according to a, a, a counterpart architectural specification. Okay, so so effectively, if in the kernel doc we extensively explain how a function is supposed to behave, probably. Uh, the, the test can be 
more uh, reliable. Okay, reliable means that so we don't need to rely on the understanding of the code from the uh, from the test guy that wrote the test. We can rely on a sort of uh, architecture uh, description. And also in doing this uh, safety scoping of the code, we can also know where we need to focus the, the effort for uh, you know, uh, static checkers. I'm thinking uh, of the tool uh, working group, for instance, and also uh, with respect to code coverage figures that would result as, a, as part of uh, you know, the test campaign that would run, okay. So, and yeah, this is, I mean, this is, these are three uh, ballots of, uh, you know, that, that I want to present today and that I would like to, to have uh, some feedbacks about. And uh, yeah, and you can find basically all of these, uh, you know, this is a work in progress. So that you are doing in the safety architecture working group and is documented um, at the link at the bottom. Okay, so, yeah, if you have questions, um, I don't know. I think I see. I don't see question and answer. I see the chat. Yeah, we, we can maybe give give the audience a couple of minutes to, to to pull together a question either in the chat or in the in the Q and A window. But what what I found interesting the, the use case actually seemed quite simple when 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 we started when we started with it, and it turned out to uncover a whole bunch of of complexity. On the one hand, understanding the architecture, but another one, as I was just looking at this, right, the do machine check uh, panic, or is it possible, for example, to do some form of, of recovery to keep the machine alive? And, and it's almost the same what we're experiencing now with COVID-19. From a safety perspective, it's easy to shut down. So the safety people, all the medical people are saying the numbers are going up, so shut down everything because from a, from a, a, a a human safety health perspective that that seems to be an intelligent thing to do but it comes with a consequence right and it's the same consequence when you shut down a lot of other things become unavailable and and new problems emerge and and we we're having you know again to come back to this question of the application class if um if you're looking at a dashboard then you might consider to be more adventurous on trying different recovery techniques because the consequence of those recovery techniques aren't that drastic because you still have the driver in the loop. Uh, while if you're driving at 70 or 80 miles an hour on the interstate um, and the kernel is kind of going into a machine check and now the question is, is it possible to recover from that machine check or not? If you do recover, you have to recover in a, in a reliably safe way uh, with a high level of integrity. Otherwise you might be introducing an even bigger problem by trying to do some recovery that that actually still has some side effect. So uh, for, 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 for anyone in the audience who's interested in these trade-off kind of discussions rather than in right or wrong, because that doesn't exist here, in trade-off discussions under constraints, these problems are really quite intriguing. Yeah, exactly. and. Uh... I mean, effectively here, it's uh, also it's quite strong, like the, the you know the, the bound between. I mean, it's qu it's quite clear what is the, also the connection between uh, you know safety and uh, and the real time deterministic behavior. So and uh, th that's a challenge uh, in Linux as, as of today. And so I, I think there was one comment that came in from, from from Stefan. Who, who said, you know, to me, as of today, most promising is having supervisor instances running those on the problem solving Linux system as well would be beneficial from cost perspective, also decreased hardware complexity. Yes, I agree. So there is supervisor instances. Uh, you're able to take those to a, to a, a long way. It, it's questionable uh, what diagnostic coverage you are able to achieve at the end with with supervisor instances there's always this weakness right if you make the supervisor window too too broad then there are lots of cases where that are actually critical that are slipping through and if you make the supervisor window too narrow then you're getting a lot of false positives and you get an impact on on availability so so the supervisor 
approach is is definitely an important one. But but it's it, it's equally a, a, a trade off, a one that drives a trade off. But it, it could be something, by the way, that I think is is worth also putting onto the shelf of of our ELISA discussions. Are we able, for example, to put a supervisor framework in place um, where we say the, the, this is how the supervisor framework is managed by the operating system and then users can put their own supervisor functionality into that framework and um, the ELISA project shows how you can substantiate integrity for that framework. So, so I think that that's a, a really good point and, and one we should, we should uh, keep on our record. Um, I think there was there's a, a second challenge I think that we identified um, in this use case, right? And this is um, the whole question of the hardware software interface and and especially when we're looking at such kernel low level features, um, what does it even mean to provide evidence and proof? that this function works as intended. Um, I think one of our intense discussions is right. So Gab obviously identified that after do machine check, it calls panic. But then we are facing the problem of, well, what does that even mean? Um, because after in panic, there are a lot of instructions that are executed that from a software perspective have no meaning if you don't know the hardware. And then you have a huge interface of complexity in front of you that just tries to explain how the system is halted. And I think that's actually one of the challenges that we don't have a good answer yet how to actually present that in a, in a reasonable way and in an understandable way that um, others somehow um, are convinced that this is full, fully understood how it is um, executed and they are aware of the consequences. Well, well the thing, I mean, from a Linux perspective, uh, it is, I think it is understood what happens. I mean, you just read through the code and- um... Yes, yes, I agree, right, from a Linux, from a, Again, we're talking about software, right? So from a source code perspective, I think it's fully understood. And I think also from a, I think also the developers exactly know why they implemented it in the way how they implemented it. But of course, if we are trying to build up evidence and an argumentation that it actually works, we have to pull together strings from, from various documents and various understandings um, that by, which is, which is a non-trivial exercise, right? I mean, it's not that you just Lucas, find one page and- the, I, I, I've just learned a new feature. We, we can actually invite participants to, to talk and, and we do have a, a hand oh, has gone up. Great. So um, I'll, I'll see if this works. I'll allow Dave Page to, to, to join us in the discussion. Um, uh, allow to talk is not available because Dave is using an older version of Zoom. Okay. <laughs> I have, so. it looks like there is uh, one question here. Um, yes, you can turn on video probably to be able to ask a question. I do not know how Dave said uh, stuff, to. but. Mm -hmm. You have to raise the hand, and then we, we can we can allow unless we now just learned that an older version of Zoom it doesn't work. So so Dave, if you can either maybe put your question into the chat or your comment, uh, anyone else, if you raise your hand, we we will actually invite you, and you can join us, and 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 we can do this orally without having to turn it into a stenographic typing exercise. <laughs> So there is uh, one comment, I think, from Stefan. Um, so to me, as of today, I'm going to read that out. To me, as of today, most promising is having supervised instances. 
running those on the problem solving Linux system as well could be beneficial from cost perspective. Also decreased hardware complexity. Gab, do you, from the software architecture perspective, do you have any comments on decreased hardware complexity? What's your thoughts on that? Um... Yeah, I mean, decreased hardware complexity, it, I think it goes into the direction of uh, uh, what uh, Lucas uh, was saying. In the, obviously, the, most, the, 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 more, the more complex is the harder, the more it's difficult to, you know, is, is to make uh, like uh, um, an extensive safety analysis that cover the whole system, including the hardware, okay? So, um, in general, uh, so uh, yeah, okay. So by supervisory instances, I, I mean, I guess, so what it means is to have like a, uh, a sort of a simple uh, supervisor uh, uh, application that uh, run on top of Linux, right? So similar to, to what we are doing uh, in the telltale use case, for example. So if, if that if that but is uh... for, so for me one of the challenges of these so we've heard these ideas of supervisor um, instances quite often but if I look at this concrete example that that you presented Gap right mm -hmm. you want to you want to make sure that this system shuts down when you get a machine a specific machine machine check exception. Mm -hmm. Now, what? how can a supervisor kind of simplify that, right? I mean, the machine check exception will be transferred to some, some instance, right? In our case, we assume it's the Linux kernel. You could say, well, it's, it's provided to a hypervisor. And then and then you want to shut down the system. So you want to make sure it, it, it panics adequately. Ah. But say, okay, a hypervisor does that. But then the same question that we just want to answer, we get a machine check exception, we handle it correctly and we shut down the system is now just deferred completely from the kernel to the hypervisor, but you have the same question. Mm -hmm. So you just okay. increase complexity Sorry. without solving anything. No, no, and for no, me, that's one of those questions of right. why build in technology if the question that you have to resolve and the challenge at hand is remains the same. Then you didn't gain anything. With that, okay. Right? Yes. Yes. Sorry. Yes. Uh, thanks, Lucas. So I actually I, I definitely misunderstood the the the, the comment. So. In, in, in my specific use case, uh, you know, having a, a hypervisor uh, instance uh, supervising the MC, uh, to be honest, um, from what I've uh, analyzed, so if I, I don't think it will make much difference because from, from the analysis I did, uh, the exception handler is a quite uh, self-contained uh, instance of code. And, uh, and I don't see, so if the hardware is broken in a way that cannot support the MC and the Linux, I don't see, I mean, how uh, we, we could take advantage. I, 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 yes, I agree with you, Gab. I think right, if, if it's broken in Linux, it's probably broken in the hypervisor as well, right? Then right, right, right. So. But, 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 but in other use cases, like, so if we look yeah. at the, yeah, so, so if you look at the Telltale use case, in that case is an advantage, but we are missing the goal of ELISA, right? So, so the thing is, obviously, if in the telltale use case, if I say, okay, I run, you know, the, the telltale uh, drawing application on Linux, and then I have a, a different uh, supervisor uh, that is, uh, you know, uh, that is uh, monitoring the, the telltale to be the right one, the expected one. Obviously, you, you solved uh, all the problem of uh, freedom from interference, and uh, you do not allocate uh, any safety claim on Linux, basically. So, but in that case, practically speaking, uh, I don't think you, you need ELISA for that, right? You can use even Linux as it is today. So, 
here the challenge is we want to to be able to to have a, a user an integrator to to make a, a safety claim on linux okay and there are different level of complexities as chris was saying before depending on the application there are you know different of level of complexities that we need to face but the main goal at the end of the day is we want to have a safety application directly running on uh, on Linux. Uh, Any other questions? Uh, Christopher, would you like to translate what you typed for us? Oh, I, I, yeah, I, I, I was curious. I, we haven't quite managed to, to, to sort out the, 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 the including participants in the discussion, I was I was curious whether Stefan had had practical experience with using supervisor instances um, in the context of, of of Linux and safety applications. That was it was more or less a, a question the other way around. Back back to the audience. Okay. So uh, St uh, Stefan says it is about logical supervisors today. Easy to easy in terms of safety to implement as external device with penalty of complexity, hard to deploy, hard to debug. If Linux could become a safety trusted execution environment, it would simplify things a lot. Yeah, I, I, I agree to the to the assessment. Yes, it's it's hard to deploy and hard to debug. And, and it's in particular the verification is um, is tricky. But yeah. At verification, right, absolutely. The verification does depend on the product um, that is in question. And that product is different from, uh, you know, instance to instance, right? So yeah. would, isn't that a coupled thing that at some level, um, the product, uh, people that are, well, system integrators and product um, engineers be responsible for, I mean, yes, you have to figure out what is relevant for that system. What are the components that you need in the kernel to be able to support your particular hardware in question? Because you have device drivers differences and a one size doesn't fit all in some ways, right? That is the complexity we are looking at in the, in terms of yeah. Elisa also. Uh, especially one, one thing that about Stefan's comment. So it, we have been thinking about this intensively as well, right? But the problem is, of course, so if you have a application running on the Linux kernel and it's producing some kind of um, some kind of output, and then you want to just supervise if that output somehow makes sense, um, determine depending on the input. And then you consider what, and you mistrust. You, so you 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 do not trust the kernel, and you'd say, okay, this could impact my application, and I just want to detect it. Then you very quickly come to the point that you somehow every computation the application makes, you identify, oh yes, so the kernel could impact that um, computation in some way modifies the stack pointer. It modifies the memory it's working with. Um, it modifies um, it, it, it modifies the program counter. So then you say, okay, to actually supervise this application with um, sufficient coverage, you are going to transfer each and every result and in various internal states to your supervision entity. But at that point, your supervision becomes more complex than the application you actually uh, want to execute. And that puts the whole idea of a lightweight supervision, um, in, turns that into a, um, yeah, into a monster that you can continue to work with, right? So uh, I'm also wondering what kind of applications, for which kind of applications does that 
reliably work. I think the IVI use case is a nice special case where you might um, get away with it. But there, are, I think, once you go into more complex systems, um, it's going to be more and more difficult to make plausibility checks on a highly complex computation. So maybe uh, Stefan can say that he he has done that and he has succeeded or has failed. <laughs> No, no, uh, yeah. Stefan says no, not done yet. Um, so, okay, so yes, please try. And if you succeed, um, let us know. Then join us, join us. Yes, join us, yes. Or, 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 um, yes, or join us building a kind of safety trusted execution environment, um, which we are building up step by step, right? And, We'll start with making sure panic shuts down the system and then go on. So this is uh, is a great discussion. So um, I don't necessarily mind keeping it going. We have about 40 minutes left in the session. Um, so Lucas, would you like to go next with the tools? Ilana is not here, so I was thinking we can have if we can have a um, discussion around safety architecture, um, tying into mm, tools, yeah. if you would like. Okay, but then I'm going, okay. Is Ilana Is that joining? okay? Is that okay? Is, yeah, that's fine. Is Ilana joining later or? She's not going to join. Okay. Um, I okay. will, uh, it looks like there is, we have a good discussion happening uh, mm -hmm. from the safety architecture. So I would like to have it going. Um, and then also tie it to your tools, and then we can talk about the kernel configurations a little bit later uh, on. Yeah, then I have to provide a bit more of introduction. But yeah. Okay. So, okay, but uh, should I uh, stop it's sharing up. the screen and give right. it to Lucas? Yeah. yeah. Any other questions quickly? Um, I'm uh, from the audience. Looks like we kind of wrapped up. I, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat. Okay, then I'll share my. Where is my? Okay. Yeah, so um, we discussed. I think, so we started from a system perspective. So Christopher talked about how you can reduce the consideration for Linux um, by just knowing the system and understanding that the system is actually in some way um, um, some fault classes really don't um, don't impact your system, and I think uh, as well, uh, uh, Gab showed that only a specific part of the kernel is is relevant. And um, then the next question is, of course, okay, how do you show quality of the kernel for specific aspects? And um, what we want to kind of discuss is how you could provide evidence and arguments on addressing certain bug classes. Um, so we are kind of starting with, an, with the motivation to show the absence of a specific bug class in the kernel confidently. Um, so that's the, the, the safety, um, um, that's somehow the derived safety goal that we want. And of course, the question is if all bug classes are similarly important or not. And this really depends on the system property um, that we are considering. Um, and just to give you a, an example, um, 
if we consider the system that Gab kind of showed, um, a null pointer exception would probably terminate this watchdog and it wouldn't pet uh, or the, would um, terminate the safety application and then it wouldn't pet the watchdog anymore. So a null pointer exception in the application or a null pointer exception in the kernel most likely would just terminate the system and hence be safe. So there are certain bug classes that are not relevant, but there are other classes that are relevant. So um, uh, if we consider a multi-threaded system and we say, well, there could be some concurrency bugs, of course, these concurrency bugs do impact um, the functional correctness of those, of those applications. So we might be interested in um, removing all concurrency bugs. But again, it depends on the kind of system we're looking at. But what we um, intend to do is we look at the system, we identify the relevant backclasses, and um, a good list of bug classes to consider are the common weakness enumeration. Um, I guess Shua will talk about that a bit more in detail. And um, once you know those, you can think about which tools address that bug class. And um, one of the investigations that we started was running those tools um, to identify the bug classes and find out how to do that with, uh, with reasonable effort and, 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 and collaboratively. Right? So if we look at the kernel and the glibc, how can we do such efforts um, collaboratively and sustainably? Um, I'll just say two things that I've observed. Um, so one thing is, in fact, um, you can find a number of people in the kernel community that use um, static analysis tools and they look at the results and they provide the patches for all true positives. So by doing that years over years, supposedly only false positives remain, modulo the mistakes that they, they overlooked, right? Um, and now if someone new comes into this community or someone with a new tool comes into this, uh, uh, runs this on this source base, you'll find many false positives, right? Because um, all the previous and parallel attempts um, have, have found all the true positives and, and you don't know about their, their findings already. So, um, so when, and, and the second observation that I've made is that some people actually want to use um, static analysis tools and they then just focus on an older released version instead of incur, incur, engaging with the current community. So again, you find out that there was a, with the static analysis tool, you'll find that there was a bug in a version that's two years old um, that often um, doesn't help you much because you actually found out, okay, this, has, uh, this code has been rewritten in the, uh, in the, in the present um, version or it has actually been already fixed. So these, um, so these kind of results kind of don't lead to a sustainable um, activity in the end. And I'll want to kind of raise a number of questions for the discussion. So I think one of the questions is if, if um, quality standards that you consider expect the use of static or dynamic analysis tools for quality assurance? And, and do you expect this to be applied um, to um, open source components you're using? And uh, do you already apply such tools internally on open source components like the, the kernel, glibc, and others? 
the base components that you might be using. So I guess with that, I would go over to the chat. Um, so one comment on yeah. what you said, Lucas, is that um, <clears throat> current kernel version applies equally to static analysis problems that we find to other bugs as well, right? Um, if you were to find a bug um, in any, even a, re, even a bug that's not related to st static checkers and uh, code coverage type things, it, it's, you still have to, if you were to find a problem in the older revision, still have to um, reproduce it and submit a fix to the upstream kernel because that's how the bugs um, fixes and changes funnel through the uh, kernel development process. It has to go upstream first and then go into stables. Just a comment to say that it's not um, specific to the experience. No, it's not. It's, I don't. It's, I don't think it's. I don't think it's specific to to these static analysis findings. But of course, I think for other kind of bugs, um, you have a. You'll come up with a program that makes this bug reproducible. Right. And you'll share that with the um, you'll share that with the community, and then you can fix it and and backport it. Um, the problem with the static analysis findings is that we encounter very many false positives, and these false positives for an older version um, can't just be transferred to a new newer version, right? It's um, we tried that I think a couple of times, and it's and it's quite tricky to do that. Um, whereas with the reproducer program, it's somehow clear. You have a program, you you run it on no version, you run it on new version. If it still crashes on the new version, it's still um, still a valid bug. With so static I analysis findings, it's really tricky. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So we have a question from uh, yeah. Stefan, co comment or question, I'll, I'll start reading. Again, some answer from my side. Um, no, I don't expect analysis tools to be applied to OS software, but practice these, those tools do not contribute that much. From the standards, more important is the development process. <laughs> okay, that's, a, that's interesting. Okay, so so if I, I'm just going to rephrase the statement and I guess maybe, yeah, we'll continue on that discussion. But so the expectation is there is no need to use static analysis find uh, tools to, to increase quality. That's what I understood. And then the second point was, well, I want to have a solid development process and that will provide me quality. For me, so I actually agree with the first statement in, in, in some way, but for me, the, the question is, what is then the definition of a, of a development process that leads to quality? Because others might then just answer, well, the use of sophisticated tools to, de to find bugs or find bug classes. But yes, I guess Stefan can answer. Oh, yes. I don't know, who, who was it Stefan? Yes, that's Stefan. Yeah. So yes, so it is subjective, Stephen. you're right. What is well, um, well, a- what is, what is a development process that induces quality? Right. And if you now refer back to the standards, we're kind of going in loops, right? Um, right. Because the standard is going to refer again to a, yeah, to analysis tools, for example. Right. There wasn't something in the chat. Uh, no. Oh. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, maybe there are other um, answers that like, other people that have an expectation here. Yeah, I, I guess the question goes back to 
what is the definition of a good development process that could vary from person to person is that uh, do you is that the a good design or a good implementation or do code reviews or uh, testing qualification yeah. or do integration testing because uh, um, sure. All of those coupled together uh, make it. Do you have a regression test? So, what does it mean? I think that is the question. Yeah. Yes, and of course, we're only looking at one aspect. And of course, all these other aspects have to be addressed as well. But um, yes, and I. So there is, yeah, I'll read the question out. A strictly yeah. spoken static analysis tools reveal not so much. Process require checks like have requirements been tested on the fun functional level? Has architecture not been violated? Yes, much about testing and integration testing. Okay, okay, so testing. So the focus should be on testing. It's good that we have Shua with us. So. Um, <laughs> right. Um, so we are um, to, to, um, so what we are looking at with the CW analysis, I post, uh, posted a couple of links. You can take a look at that, uh, common weakness enumerations. Uh, we are looking at multiple different angles, right? We are also looking at um, testing and fuzzing and how they couple to what tools we have in the kernel right now to be able to uh, look at these uh, top, we have these top uh, 25, um, if you want to click on that, uh, Lucas, we can uh, we can oh. do that too. I just posted a top 25 weaknesses um, by Mistra. Um, so we are looking at and say, looking at those common weaknesses and say, hey, do we have a means for us to make sure that common weakness is addressed in the kernel development process and kernel itself in terms of, do we have a mechanism to it's in the chat, Lucas. I just yeah, yeah, I got it. So, um, so we do we have a detection mechanism for this? And if we do have a detection mechanism for that, do we, in addition to detection mechanism, do we have a mitigation? Um, and if and we, mitigation can be multiple different things. Like for example, mitigation runtime mitigation, and then also during the qualification process. Do we use that, use the, can this um, detection and mitigation uh, be used during the debugging phase or product, product qualification phase? And that we make sure the bits we are putting out don't have uh, the ones that we identified. And the other, other aspect is runtime. Runtime is what kind of uh, kernel uh, mitigation techniques do we have that can be enabled? Uh, you have to look at, can those be enabled also? So not all of the de de detection mechanism, mitigation mechanisms are applicable to a certain uh, product. So that's where the product side comes in. Can we safely enable this mitigation feature for our product? So once you determine that, um, then you can figure out, you, you kind of develop this uh, um, detection, mitigation, runtime mitigation, all of those together and figure out what do we have in the kernel. For example, um, Lucas just talked about, um, alluded to uh, concurrency issues, right? So, um, and then use, use after free type issues. So we have a mechanism, KM SAN um, a mechanism that we use fuzzing. We turn on kernel address sanitizers, uh, memory sanitizers, uh, debug options, and then we run fuzzing tools on those. So we find various problems and we go fix them. Those are the use after free type things that uh, um, that will show up here um, in the uh, eight, number eight CWE four sixteen yeah. is it's talking about use after free. That's a that a good, a good example of how we are going to be doing um, it, it bringing kernel aspect into it, kernel development process, how we can go. And fix at the, at the end of the day, the way we can uh, do this is by finding problems and uh, fixing them and um, addressing all of these mechanisms and provide a guideline for um, Alisa uh, from the Alisa point of view, provide guidelines for system integrators and say, hey, these are all the resources you have available for you. Um, any comments yeah. on that, Lucas and Christopher? Yeah, I think, and, 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 and it's. 
I mean, right, as you said, right, so um, we, we can see Kazan is kind of one, one tool that you can use during, um, during your integration or do, we can use it during the kernel development. Um, but also there you face a challenge. So, I mean, uh, we've been using fuzzing also actively a lot. And again, you face a challenge of having the problem of many false positives or um, um, the problem that of course you can't um, fuzz everything uh, to a sufficient high level of coverage. So then you can rely on static analysis and dynamic analysis and various methods kind of adding up to argue that um, you have taken a number of mitigations to address a certain bug class. And I think, and then of course, as you said, runtime mitigations are possible as well. So we can see the same, right? Just recently, uh, there, there's a new functionality proposed, KFence, which is kind of an address sanitizer that um, is intended for production use. So use in within the product um, by being a bit more imprecise, but uh, still allowing to, to uh, have not the performance impacts that um, let's say the previous versions of address sanitizers had. I think right. uh, we're seeing many things kind of coming together to argue that there's an um, absence of a, of a bug class. But of course, yes, how, how do you build this together? And um, I think one of the questions really is then, okay, how do you collect evidences together? And, um, and that's here what I'm just, just suggesting was, one type of evidence, um, and that's for static, uh, the assessing these uh, findings from static analysis tools together um, and, and, and engaging in, in kind of a collaborative work rather than in individual attempts. So, so I, I, I might have the outlier position here because I, I, I think the techniques are really valid what I kind of also see is there are some prerequisites that have to be met. And, and again, you know, it's, you always have all these shades of gray in these discussions, but, but on the conservative side, the techniques that we're looking at and, and, and static code analysis and everything else works quite nicely for code that has more or less a, a, an entry point and an exit point and, and, and um, can have a very complex mission in between. Um, like like scheduling algorithms, those kind of algorithms, where, where I think it gets really hard. And where also from ARM's microprocessor side, we, we see challenges is where you start seeing a tremendous amount of functionality interacting with each other in ways that aren't predictable. So everything that's driven off interrupts, where you get an interrupt mm -hmm. and then you get another interrupt because you then need to make sure that you have your context under control. And the difficulty thing when, when you operate with interrupt is it, it's very easy to lose the context. So, so on, the, on the architecture side of, of a processor, a tremendous amount of effort is put into validating context integrity. Because once you've lost the context of your processor, you've more or less lost the ability to predict deterministically what what happens, it, it, it may work, it may not work, nobody knows. And, and those bugs that emerge out of the subtle context corruption are very, very difficult to find. And um, I, I think they are probably outside of the scope of, of what can be achieved with these test, testing techniques. So, so I think the techniques really, really valuable for, for a certain problem space, but I, I, I'm, I, I kind of hear words of acknowledgement coming from, from, from Lucas. I think you're not going to be able to take these techniques and, and argue, for example, the safety capability of an operating system like Linux no. just based on, 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 on this, because all these other interaction aspects 
yeah, yeah. multiple yeah. In, with interrupts you in in essence have infinite entry points and infinite exit points because you don't know when it's when it's occurring right and then you start reaching limits yes I, I, but i think so from my experience of investigation of of, of kernel bugs i mean these bugs that you're talking about they're they're certainly the nasty ones that are hard to reproduce, hard to hard to even pinpoint and then and, and, and identify and so on. But um, the I think the majority of bugs that happen are simply uh, software bugs where certain contracts of the functions just haven't been fulfilled. Right, so it, it expects. It expects um, that right, you call certain functions, functions in a certain order. You use first get CPU, then you use put CPU. Um, you you uh, you don't use after you free something, and so on. Right. So these kind of bug classes you can address, and they have similar impact on the on the functional correctness. Um, so, so of course, it doesn't. These tools, by no means, replace testing. Um, and um, but especially when you talk about. Um, yeah, I, I'd go beyond testing. I, I think for for certain types of bugs, you actually need architecture measures. I, I think they get yeah. almost impossible to argue that you to code analysis and and however much testing you do, you will find them right. And, and the question is, can you argue that those cases are, are residual and you don't care about them? And that's where I, I, I would say no, I, I've seen, and again, it's due to the nature of my job be, being in the architecture group of ARM, um, we, we see a lot of those, those problems. They're very, very subtle. They are, as you rightly said, they're in, um, almost impossible to reproduce, but at the same time, uh, we know that they exist. Yeah. yeah. So we have yeah. one comment from yeah. Stefan again. Uh, he's talking to, he's um, responding to my uh, CWE and detection uh, mitigation. Yes, there is, uh, now you lost me, list is about uh, security, not safety. Yes, there are overlaps. Yes, so that's, that's where we um, as agree to one mitigation measure. So, um, so what we are looking at is, yes, you're right. Um, the, this, these are uh, tend to be safe security focused. However, what we are looking at is taking these into a pl a looking at mitigations, detection and mitigation that um, are uh, uh, relevant to safety. So that's what I would yeah. say in terms of we have to, because we are going to find an overlap. The example we took is use after free, which is kind of easy to talk to in a way. Um, it is, there is a, a clear overlap between say, safety and security in this respect. Yes, I mean, in, in some way, right? Security is always uh, security is always summarized as uh, confidentiality, integrity, and availability, right? And if you want to say, okay, where's the overlap with safety? Um, we we could say, well, for some systems, availability is irrelevant. For some safety systems, availability is irrelevant, as as Gab showed, right? If the system doesn't react anymore, you assume an external watchdog that 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 identifies that and 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 and, and leads to a safe state, which is a, a general assumption that you can often make. Um, and of course, confidentiality as well. That, that's not relevant in the safety context, at least as long as you look at safety. In an isolated way, so the so the overlap is really just the integrity aspect, um, but just the integrity aspect is is quite a big class, right? So there are various bugs that would lead to uh, violating the integrity of your of your application, and all those bug classes you can kind of. Um, w uh, identify together with this with security groups and you can apply the same methods as um, security groups might do. 
the I think the big difference is really just that a security group might say, um, once I have the mitigation and and it works, I'm f it's fine for me. Whereas in the safety area, we always are interested in how do I document and how do I provide the evidence um, that that I did this in a proper way, um, which is yeah, which is kind of a speciality of, of safety. So that's a good point about integrity, right? That's kind of what we are uh, aiming for in a in by combining all different tools. Um, example, taking uh, I'm giving this example as a combining tools, different tool sets to achieve the goal of integrity and quality, right? The KCOW, use KCOW results, um, take them into funneling into initiating um, yeah. testing through uh, fuzzing tools. So combining that information and figuring out in um, the power of the, these two tools to achieve a goal. So that's one example. So yeah. we are really what we're really trying to do is we have we have a multitude of different things: architecture, uh, kernel, um, how we qualify the kernel with detection, mitigation, and techniques. And are we going to really achieve 100%? I don't think so. Nobody will say that. But do we get to a place where uh, we can um, uh, comfortable with the safety, at least. That's yep. that's my in, um, idea. Yeah, I think that's I think what that's my well, thought is on that. Yeah, I think right. So when 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 I say okay, the absence of a certain bug class, right? I mean that's um, that's not absolute absence. It's having confidence that all of the methods that are state of the art have been applied and that you can you understand and you can explain to someone else how these methods are effective in your system right and and how they how they um in, in some way, how they complete each other, and 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 with that, you have a good argument, um, and and that's what we're looking at, um, static analysis being one, the other one looking at testing results, the other about architectural mitigations, but kind of combining that, is going to give you the puzzle pieces. Um, Chris. So there was one more comment from from Stefan. With, with, right. You know, to what extent uh, have have we have we considered, for example, something like soft lockstep? And and soft lockstep has been around for, for a long time. Um, yes, I I always joked. I mean, I, I I was involved in 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 the first development of the first uh, lockstep quasi at Freescale, in which was started in two thousand seven. And then got certified in 2010, and and the big value of the hardware lockstep is really the ability to ascertain a diagnostic coverage for random hardware faults, independent of of software. Uh, that creates a big value. It it comes at a cost, but that, in my opinion, this this the decoupling uh, is 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 the main benefit. If once you say you start doing soft lockstep. You run into into basically two problems. First of all, you need to create an architecture that facilitates replica determinism, so your two software replicas don't diverge too far. That you continuously keep them coupled to one another, even in the event of uh, of random faults occurring. So that typically involves uh, some time coupling, and and the whole world of time triggered systems kind of feeds on that principle and says we we enable the replica determinism and, and, and soft lockstep and other nice features that come along with it. The, the downside is that once you use software based lockstep systems to argue diagnostic coverage for random hardware faults, it, it's just very, very tedious because the, the, the semiconductor manufacturer produces the hardware and understands how all the gates and everything are connected and, and done. But then you have to integrate the operating system and the processes on top until you have 
an entity that's big enough that you can actually start demonstrating that you have achieved diagnostic coverage. And, and usually in a, in a typical automotive supply chain, uh, the integrator at the far end, when you have enough integration ach level achieved that you could start seeing software locks that execute, has no interest in ascertaining the diagnostic coverage of the underlying hardware. So, so it's almost the, 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 this challenge of, of first being able to constitute that, that your coverage is given once you've achieved a fairly high amount of, of integration. That might be different in other areas where you have a, a smaller integration pipeline where you, for example, um, uh, in, in, in some of the industrial systems, I think it's possible. I think in, in medical systems, it's, it's possible. Uh, but in, in areas where you have a longer supply chain and a longer supply path, it, it, it gets tricky. But it's a, it's a very good technique and it, it has a whole uh, bunch of, of benefits that it, that it added, adds. Yep. Yeah, I, I agree. But I think the challenge is also right. This, just this communication of, of fault models is, is a challenge, right? I mean, um, you want to explain, you, you have to explain to the, to the integrator and, and in some way to the application developer that creates this software lock step or, or soft lock step, um, what kind of faults you are considering in various components and they have to determine what would be the impact, how could I potentially observe such faults in, in the application that's running in a lock, lockstep mode. And I think various initial attempts of that have, have turned out to, to be, um, to, to result to very strange plausibility checks. And, 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 and maybe that was just due to the, let's say, limited effort, but it certainly showed the challenge that is involved in such systems yeah. to, to, to communicate fault models in a structured and complete way um, that you can actually build up an argument. And yes, I think we're, face, we're facing that challenge quite often um, with these highly complex systems nowadays. Thank yeah. you, Lucas. I think that's a good that we are. We have a we're almost out of time. Three minutes more left, but that's a good uh, closing. I think in some ways, saying that we are dealing with complex systems. And to Chris's point, that Christopher's yeah. point, that um, it it has to span uh, multiple layers here. Um, thinking about the architecture and then the kernel components you pick for that architecture and. Um, even the user space that resides on that to be able to bring all of this together. Um, so, uh, so this has been a great discussion. Um, uh, and then thank you, Stefan, for uh, your active participation and bringing your insights. Uh, it's been very valuable. Um, I uh, posted a Elisa Tech, uh, our website there, uh, link to that. And then please join us. Um, we are continuing our efforts and we are engaging the kernel community in various we have been engaging kernel community directly with the static analysis and then um, bringing some of the uh, problems we are finding, uh, detection mitigation type things that we are engaging. And then also we are reaching out in these forums at various conferences. So please be on the lookout for our next mini conference or our next engagement. Thank you all the panelists here. Thank you, Lucas, Gab and Christopher. For thank you. Yeah, thank you. And I uh, hope we'll see you more of the audience in our discussions. Yep. Yes. Thank you. Engage with us. Um, uh, learn more about it at the Alisa Tech um, uh, site I, uh, link I posted on the um, chat channel. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Bye. 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 Have a nice weekend.